this afternoon to uh, meet uh, David Hefkatz and uh, to see his exhibition and also to hear him speak about his art and his career. Uh, this is uh, David's first exhibition in uh, Paris, indeed in France, and uh, Gary Beckler de Obok is very honored to have him and his very beautiful works. And the exhibition itself is in the form of a mini retrospective. The earliest works that you might have seen as you enter the gallery uh, on your left are from the 1950s, uh, from the time that David was still an art student at the Slade School, one of the great uh, art schools of London. And uh, the other works that you'll see on the walls and also downstairs are from later periods, from the 1980s, the 90s, the 2000s and have an extraordinary diversity of style. David is indeed a very, very eclectic artist, as you will find out through, uh, from his speech. And I also want to very much thank uh, Robert Devshish, who is uh, uh, the gentleman uh, videoing behind you, who is David's uh, art dealer in London, uh, in a very beautiful gallery called the GD Art Gallery. If you ever have a chance to visit uh, London in the next few months, it's on Children's Street, just behind the Wallace Collection. Yeah, between the Wallace Collection and Baker Street. So, uh, just to, uh, David has uh, studied, uh, if, if you don't mind turning off all your telephones, this is a good uh, alarm for us all. Uh, David has uh, studied the 1950s at the Slade School in London. One of his famous teachers is Keith Vaughan, who's one of the great English artists of the post war period, uh, a rather romantic artist. In the 1960s, uh, he spent uh, uh, a good many years at the Ahmadu Bello University in Nigeria, uh, where he became very, very familiar with Nigerian culture, and where he started collecting these very, very beautiful fabrics that you see here, and which he will be showing you later, which are by the Hausa people. These, this is a particular uh, uh, people of Nigeria that live in the north, and are very, very famous for their embroideries. And you will see also how those uh, had a great impact on his art <coughs> of particular periods. Uh, most of the collection was indeed given to the British Museum, so these are a few rare examples that are still left in David's uh, collection. So, without any further ado, David, I'll let you uh, present your own art. Okay. All you have to say is next. <laughs> Bonjour and uh, good afternoon, and it's lovely to see you. It's a wonderful, large audience of uh, bright, smiling people. <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> I spend most of my time in my studio in complete silence, and I, I love that too. But the, uh, the contrast tonight. Um, I must say that it's a tremendous pleasure to be in Paris again. I first came in 1948. I've come many times after it whenever I could, and. Um, the first picture I'm going to show you, in fact, is uh, a drawing which I made here on my way to Dijon and found a little garden down by the, on the other side of the Place uh, de uh, la Bastille. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's really, it sums up in a sense something of Paris for me. D very d dainty trees um, and uh, beyond these tall buildings, which for me are very French, and then the knowledge that beyond this little garden there is the Canal Saint Martin. Uh, with the boats on the other side there. It was, a, it was a very quiet moment, and I found it, did my drawing, and then off to Dijon. Lovely moment. Neat. I'm going to start off with a painting which you'll be surprised to see. <laughs> it's not actually mine. It was painted in the 19th century by, as you see, an artist, Walter Spindler. And Walter Spindler was one of the Oscar Wilde group, very famous, of course, in Paris. And there's a wonderful monument, of course, to Oscar Wilde by Epstein in, uh, in the city. And Walter Spindler, did, he was in love with Sarah Bernhardt, and he painted numerous very fine portraits of Sarah. When he retired, he, he returned to London and lived in Victoria Street. Uh, those of you who know London will know it's just close to Victoria Station. My father got to know him in the 1920s and became his private secretary, carer really. And when my father married, he invited, uh, Walter invited my father and his new wife to take, in, take his apartment and he moved around the corner to the Grosvenor Hotel. So my first two years were in a, an artist's studio with behind a curtain, many of these paintings of his though, of Sarah Bernhardt in life in the, in the 1890s. And we moved to the country, Kent, when I was two years old. 
But I went back on occasions with my father, and I remember next, uh, kneeling on the window seat, uh, looking across straight across the, the, the road at this very handsome building, it's uh, Westminster Cathedral. I'm showing you this really because I want to emphasize that I'm very much a retrospective artist. I look, I in many ways live in not so much the past, but I live with my memories and I, I live with my imagination now and wait in many respects for things to talk to me. Sometimes I don't understand them, sometimes I do, and something like this might come up and I think, oh, that just reminds me of Westminster Cathedral. And I won't keep on talking about these memories, but they are there throughout the work. Next. We moved to country, it's me on the left there, my brother on the right. He became a journalist, was always inside reading, um, and I was, I was always outside. We, we had animals, goats and chickens and geese and dogs and cats, and I was a wonderful life. And in those days, at the age of six or seven, I could uh, take the dog and go off into the woods. I never got lost. I seemed to have a, a good sense of uh, direction in the country. I'm hopeless in the town. <laughs> uh, well, fortunately, I've got a good wife who's got a wonderful sense of direction. And uh, it, was a, it was a lovely life. And uh, naturally, these are also memories from this time which are, are, are built into my paintings without being specific. I was uh, an art student for four years in Canterbury, and uh, then I did my national service, worked a bit in London, and got a place at the Slade, the Slade School, in uh, part of University College. And during that time, I, had, I was living in a basement, a tiny little room that looked out into the garden, and when I opened the window, cats would come through the long grass and look at me, and I had no room, but I had a, a friend, a neighbour, this lady, Betty Luckett, who lived with her daughter, little daughter. Just, uh, just across the way. And she said to me one day, David, you're an artist. You know, if you'd like me to sit for a portrait, I'd be happy to do that. I just, I, I like sitting still. Mm -hmm. She liked ironing and she liked sitting still. <laughs> <laughs> Which was marvellous. And she said for at least, uh, I'm sorry? I thought somebody said something. Um, she sat for at least 100 uh, sittings and I still didn't get around to the hands. Uh, <laughs> I was struggling, really, at this time, to come to terms with my beginnings as an artist. I felt that I had to be a good, objective artist, and I wasn't, in a sense, happy about it, that I was disciplining myself. And I made the self-portrait, which is here in the exhibition at that time. And I think there's a sense, perhaps, of uh, my young self, still a bit rather naive and perhaps rather anxious about how I was going to become an artist, how I was going to earn my living kind of worries that one does have as a young artist. Yeah. Anyhow, a friend of mine came to sit for me. He was a, an academic, I still know him, he was an old friend, and uh, he, he was really quite proud that he was going to be sitting for his portrait you know. And I think he imagined himself as one of those people around the college walls, you know, within their, in their gowns and so on. So you, I think you can see that in the way he's, he's posed, looking straight at you, straight upright. And he was, um, his mother apparently had saved a place for this picture in, in their house. Uh, <laughs> well, I, um, I was still struggling. And then one day, uh, Claude Rogers said to me, go down to the Tate and have a look at the Cezanne. So I went down to the Tate and I saw a Picasso Cubist painting. And I thought, oh, wow, look at that. And I suddenly, I, without being able to put any of it in, into words, I was suddenly aware that there was a... a I'll use this phrase again, a window opening into my imagination. And uh, I could construct pictures in my own way. So I took the picture down to Kent, to my parents' house, got into the shed, which I'd used as a studio, and repainted the whole thing. And it worked. And uh, I still love this painting, but he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny, because I had a retrospective in Folkestone, and the person who opened it, uh, Brian Porter, that's him, was standing there. And this girl said, um, this lady said, uh, well, I'm opening this exhibition, etc., etc." And she said, you know, my favourite picture is Brian Porter. <laughs> and, uh, but I understand his, his mother has saved uh, places for it and she wouldn't take it. Uh, he wouldn't even show it to her. Uh, poor old Brian. I, I thought, well, it really, it's, it serves you right. Because I've been very hurt. You know, you do something for, for a close friend. And you say, look, finish. And then he comes in and says, oh, 
He said, my, my mother won't accept that. She's got a place for it. So that's the story. I, I, as you see, I think you've got it. Okay. Now, this is a bit of a contrast, isn't it? But you already know from what uh, Chris says that I was in Nigeria. And uh, I went there. I taught in Southern Rhodesia for eight years. Then I went to Nigeria and took charge of art history in a university there. And the first year I painted, and I had a very good year painting. And then I suddenly thought, I should really, as an art historian, be making some records. Things here are going to change. The modern world, the modern world is going to take over. And a lot of this work is going to be destroyed. There was weaving, there was embroidery, there was pottery, and so on. And so I started the study of this. This is briefly, this is a man's gown, the sleeves are right, it's very big. And all this light colour, this is a great pocket, by the way, um, is embroidery. It's a wild silk embroidery. And I'd love to talk about this for the next hour. <laughs> I won't. Anyhow, I made a large collection, wrote a doctoral study of it. Uh, it. During that time, I brought a major exhibition of house of art to London. Got myself an international <laughs> reputation, which I didn't need. I mean, I've never, never really needed it since. Um, and uh, over 100 of these went to the British Museum. Mm -hmm. That's another one. It's a horse blanket. Mm -hmm. I'll try not to say too much about these. Mm -hmm. You can see one of the things about these, of course, is the colour. Mm -hmm. A very, very sophisticated colour in the first instance, the blue and the, the light colour of embroidery. In this case, much stronger. Next. That pattern I've got here, I've got a wrapper like this one mm -hmm. by, by me here. This was actually our, it had disappeared by the time I was studying the embroidery. But by chance, I happened to hear somebody mention something which led to something else. I got drawings of these, of this made by two different art uh, embroideries. So I knew I'd got the, the correct thing, the authentic. I had it made up. So it's really a historical piece which I've drawn out of the past. She's actually playing a, an instrument called a chanteau, which is beating it. And she, and she sings at the same time. Next. <coughs> well, the, the effect of Nigeria and Africa generally, the light, the colour, was profound. And uh, my colour changed considerably. I show you this one because it's, it's one example of the way in which Africa came into my pictures almost unexpectedly. I was working, working the, the thing around. My pictures evolve over sometimes a long period, um, they get painted out, repainted, bits to get taken out, and so on. And uh, this, this process was going on, and then I painted in this plant here, I just felt <coughs> like painting a plant, and suddenly I saw it as a maize plant, it's very much like a maize plant actually, and immediately I felt, well, <laughs> the, the title came from my, my feeling about this. I thought as if the window had opened up and I was looking out into a Nigerian landscape. There are other references to Africa. You can probably see there are some pots down there, for instance. Uh, that, that's, that's wonderful. Next. And also, there was a feeling of power, in a sense, strength, which I translated straight into these paintings in one way or another. There's something of African sculpture about this. The uncompromising contrast of, of shapes, the use of straight lines. Curiously, this was inspired by a walk in the country in winter. I was walking over a snowy, I we were walking up a big slope, slope after snow. It was thick. There was nobody about. It was silent. I was trudging through the snow. All of a sudden, I felt I was one of a group of hunters, bent on killing, uh, basically. Not that I'd, I'd do it. I tried once. I bought myself a rifle in Africa. and mm -hmm. went out to, to, to shoot a buck, which was one of a pair, which I knew, I knew where they'd be. I went out. I actually raised my gun, and I thought, I can't do this. And I went home and sold the gun. So that's what I think about hunting. Um, <laughs> and we needed the food, actually. Uh, so there is there's that, there's the African element. When I was in Nigeria during, during my first year there, I did lots of painting, all inspired by England. And I've been away from England for eight years. As soon as I got back to England, all my paintings were inspired by Africa. So I, that's what I mean by a retrospective kind of artist. Yeah. 
Uh, I put this one just really to emphasise colour. It's there at the, the bottom of the collar, and in fact it looks a lot better there than the effect one gets with a, a picture. But anyhow, you've got the, I wanted to make the point about the colour. Yeah. This one was one of a series of paintings done in, uh, in a way I don't usually work, painted for an exhibition specifically about colour. And I had no specific thing in mind apart from a kind of sunlit landscape. And then something happens which occasionally does, and sometimes it's tremendously successful. I've done this over big paintings, and that is to draw a line very quickly. It's a statement, it's a kind of a whiplash in a way. And it's done very quickly, and what's happened here is that I've, drew, I've drawn the, the bird, painting that bird, very, very quickly. And with, without quite realising what I'm doing, but what I was doing was making a straight, a clear statement about space. Immediately, you've got the space between that bird. The bird's got to be flying through space, and there it is. So for me, that made the picture. Next. And this one... I'd like to tell you the kind of changes that took place in these paintings, but it's impossible. I can't, I don't even know them myself. But I do remember with this one that I, I had this in a state of flux, and then the, the sort of standing stones, that one there and these here, made an appearance. I say that because things tend to come into a painting. People say people come into a painting and they may well leave. They may well say, we don't like this painting, we're going. <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it. They just fall to pieces. Um, anyhow, that, that's what happened. And then I had the sun and moon up there, and then I brought in the beam of light and messed around and scraped it and then it worked. It was a uh, solstice. That one is uh, just on the other side of the curtain there. This one is a good example of distortion. Distortion is very important after I came back from Africa. I found that by distorting something, I could actually get into a more imaginative situation. And in this case, the distortion, the head is slightly enlarged, and uh, the shoulder is pulled out. And it's, it's that process, pulling it out so it makes you, it makes you, perhaps it startles you, you think, you know, shoulders don't look like that. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that as a result of pulling out that shoulder, I'm using the figure as part of a composition. Objects in a picture shouldn't be there on their own. They should all be locked in as shapes with the other shapes in the painting. And in this case, that locking in of the figure with this negative shape here has become more dramatic, more effective by locking itself in with this shape here. So you've got that and that and that. And, and those three elements, they're not the only ones in the drawing, painting, <coughs> but uh, they, they become very important. Next. And this one again. This, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, but I think this started off the life drawing. So that in the head up here, and the body that so was that way around, and I got fed up with it, got tired of it, turned it around and started playing around with it, pushing, putting in uh, various things. So you can see I've scribbled in some I'm getting, getting to the scribbling stage here almost. And I think scribbling is, is a wonderful way of, if, if you can get it going, it works, it, a, a way of communicating directly in an effective way with, with a drawing or a painting. And there's much more vitality in that head, I'm quite sure, than the one I've got in, in the life drawing. And also these heads, there is, there's distortion there, there's a certain amount of I'm not quite sure what to call it, aggression, strength being pushed into the painting. And that energy, that particular kind of energy, is uh, uh, bringing to life these three heads in the same way. So that all of a sudden they take on a feeling of belonging to each other, of a sort of family feeling. And the same with this one. This would have been the elements in this one would have been moved around a lot. Again, I can't tell you exactly what happened. There are the remnants of lines here and here. There's a jumble of, of lines out of which those three heads have grown. Um, and I come back to this drawing myself, as I do with paintings which I love, 
There's, I don't know whether you know the National Gallery very well in London, anybody, but there's a painting there, Diana and Acteon. And I go back to that painting every time I go to the National Gallery. I stand in front of it and I think, I don't think, what does it mean? I just stand in front of it and uh, I'm, I'm bathed with a feeling of enigma for one to one, to one, to some extent. Uh, and I stand with this, I come back to this one and I am actually taking part in something which I can't quite explain, but which is in itself extraordinarily satisfying. Next. I talked about memories, and I don't want to go on about that too much, but uh, this is a very important one, because when I was four years old, no, wait a minute, uh, yes, four years old, I was taken to Alton Towers in Staffordshire. There's a fun thing there now, and, but this, this garden is still there, this garden with a pagoda. And I remember myself standing, it must have been about here, just on the edge, uh, looking across the pagoda. And that image is, was so strong that I still sometimes dream that I'm looking at the pagoda and I'm looking down and there are these great fish going slowly backwards and forwards in the water. It's extraordinary, a yeah, haunting dream. And uh, sometimes I have actually put a sort of pagoda shape in the picture and actually put pagoda in the title. <coughs> Next. And that, that feeling of strangeness, or out of contrast as well, between one element and another, which is here in the collages, for instance, is something which I found very fascinating when I was a child, when we had no videos, no television, not all that many books, but uh, one of the books we had was a very nice copy of Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, and I was fascinated by that book. And it's this contrast between these two... Um, scenes, if you like. Alice goes, I'm sure you know the book, and she's in the shop, talk, suddenly she finds herself talking to a shopkeeper. The shopkeeper is a sheep. And then she finds herself in a rowing boat on the wall. And there's the shop still, and the sheep is commenting on her, on her, her rowing. Feather, says the, the sheep. Feather. <laughs> and uh, Alice says, why, what is, why does she keep saying feather? And there's something about this which is important for me in connection with my childhood. And that is that in the 1930s, I had relatives in Whitstable where we'd settled for a while, before we went into the country. I visited relatives' houses, and in their front rooms there were always, there was a window, a window with probably quite small panes and an aspidistra, and uh, the furniture was all covered over with antipacassas and uh, the rugs and gold frame pictures and so on, cluttered sort of interior. So it has that memory, as well as being this lovely contrast between two opposing scenes. And the, the same thing is in this picture, which is uh, just as you come in. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's here on the wall there. Um, the, uh, this was a landscape with figures. This, this was, was taking shape. And there's a lot of scraping down here. And I, I have a feeling that she went in quite late. <laughs> Um, a white girl with a, an African sort of mask and then the, the headdress. I can remember actually making that headdress with a palette knife. And I, I thought, oh, good, this, is, this has worked. I wasn't quite sure what I'd made, but I had a feeling that it worked. Next. And that feeling of the rather well, surrealist contrast between two elements is there. Uh, polish it up. There's one of these up here. I bought an old encyclopedia, which wasn't a very good encyclopedia as such, but it had beautiful engravings in it. And uh, I cut the engravings up, and uh, for about a month, I should think, I made these collages. And I was absolutely riveted making these things. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning to, to start on them. I made about 40 of them in all. It was a wonderful experience. That, uh, that one, of course, uh, well, as you can see, phrenolo phrenological head, I think it might be. Uh, where there's colour, that's, that's coloured by that. Oops. And this one, there are a lot of elements here. The balloon, the leaning tower of Pisa, that, I think that's Florence, the hand. Uh, there's a equestrian statue down there. There are several church things in the landscape, anatomical head. There's a big bird. Torch, you know, a well with a torch there, which has been pasted on and pulled off. Next. And this one, well, it's a pagoda here. 
the porcelain tower at Nanking. It's just this structure here. And a whole lot of things up here, as you can see. It's um, Istanbul, Santa Sophia. It's Moscow. I always, I've never been to Russia, but I always felt that Moscow would be fascinating and rather mysterious. And at the same time, quite threatening. It may not be. Um, anyhow, that Turkish man, there are these vertical, and there may be a pagoda echo amongst those things mixed. And this, this is, I, I feel, this is very much about travel. I love traveling. Not airplanes, I'm not really interested in airplanes or ships, not much. Um, but, uh, but railways, oh yes, I'd always hop on the train. <laughs> and when I go for walks in the country, it's hop on the train, get out the station, walk, come back to the station, back on the railway again. So we've got a lady walking from the, left, from the right to the left, and uh, a canal for boats to pass, and a sailing ship up there behind the trees, and then up at the top, the aqueduct with the bird making its curious passage uh, down from the right to the left. Next. So passage and, and the sea is another thing that comes into my pictures. Here the imagined Victorian aeroplane, the boat, the camel, finger pointing, and so on. But uh, it's not purely travel, it's a mixture of things. Next. And it's the same thing. The aqueduct. The aqueduct gives it that sense of, of travel. And this, this one, I'm pretty sure that right at the end, I've, I've begun to get the fish going there, and then it's just the one there, and then the water had come in, and then the, almost the last thing I think I did was to put the red bridge I needed to travel across the picture. Next. And this one, if this, was un, this is unusual in that it was painted over the top of the drawing, which I made on a 17-mile walk. I did twice from Canterbury to Dover. And it was quite simply a, a little path going up a hill between trees. That was all. It was quite closed in, almost like a little tunnel. And I painted it, repainted it, repainted it, repainted it, and eventually I got um, something which satisfied me. And unusually, I uh, put the two little figures in, disappearing over the, over the rise. And this one. Again, I just I would just probably keep saying, I hope I don't bore you by saying I don't know what happened, how I got to this point. But obviously the blue and the orange colour became a land and sea. And then at that stage I wanted to make a statement and I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on this. It had to be put down quite quickly, like the whip the whiplash drawing for a bird. And so in it went, in it went the lines, and I was travelling across the land. Why I put that in, I don't know, but for me, it, it's a very nice contrast with the other lines. Very, very simple, but to me, it's in a lot to me. Yeah. And this one again. When I left Nigeria in 1979, I crossed the Sahara with my combi, come back to England to settle, uh, crossing with a friend. It was a lovely journey, and we went through in the north, Algeria, and we embarked at Algiers. And uh, well, it's, it's really something about that kind of journey. And the other element here is a contra not a contrast, is a combination of sea and sky in one colour. That's both sea and also sky. And I'd be quite interested, I won't go around asking you what do you think, but uh, I would be quite interested to know what your reaction is. Now, do you read that as sea and sky as well? You can't read them both at the same time. You have to keep clicking from one to the other. I know. It's there. So the sea is, uh, is quite an important element. When I was two years old, we moved to Kent. We were living in Whitstable. The sea was just there. I grew up within a couple of miles of the sea. I was quite often with my friend Brian Porter on the in boat on, on the sea rowing. And this, <coughs> this, this started off I'm almost 100% certain as a, a still life painting. Why I should want to sit down and do a still life painting, I don't know. But I think I did. It didn't last very long, and uh, then I changed it, and the two apples are still there. 
bit changed, but I managed to bring in the sand almost without realizing it. And then there's this suggestion. And that suggestion of the sea is just enough to enable me to smell, you know, this, the, uh, the air, sea, the sea breeze drifting across uh, into my studio. One, again, I'll, I'll show you this one because of the element of the sea, I think, that the land on the, on the left there, and then these two strange animals which, which developed, I'll say. And then right at the end, well, I think I needed for, I don't like to use the word decorative because I don't think of myself as decorative artist, but in a sense, there's no harm in having some decoration in the pictures. I mean, this is extremely decorative. But I drew those lines in, and as I drew them, I felt I was making the sea. I don't think you would get more abstract for a sea than that. Mm. But uh, that's, what, that's what it was for me. Mm. Next. <clears throat> and this one again, the, it's a clue postcard on the left, which has been cut, and there's another part of it is there, famous painting by Clue. And uh, then a repetition of it in the center, and the uh, photocopy of boats in the background. Again, it's the sea, but it's only a suggestion through the, the sails and the 19th century harbour building in the background. And for me, I, I would be pretty sure that I had in my mind, as well as a number of other things, a very beautiful picture by Caspar David Friedrich of his young wife. And she is, uh, she's at a little square window looking out, looking down, and below her there is a harbour. You can't see any boats, except you can see some masts sticking up behind the window. It's, a, it's an absolute <coughs> choice picture. And that idea, I think, of saying something in an oblique way, with, in this case, the masts, is what I was, what I was doing. Next. This one, <laughs> I'm very fond of this one, even when I can't see it. I remember it very well. It was, uh, I was having a terrible struggle. I, I, I have struggled, struggles with paintings, I can tell you. I don't paint, I'm not, I don't think I've got very much talent, really. <laughs> I just work, and I, you know, I think, oh, come on, get up and get in the studio and work. So I can remember very much, this was, all oh, this was all turbulent, and I couldn't get anything going, and then I got the beach, um, huts in, the sea in the background, and that, remember that, that getting that in, and I thought, oh, that's a, that works nicely. And uh, then a from a man standing there. He was actually standing, just looking at us, you know, sort of straight up and down like this. And, uh, and then I got this feeling, I <laughs> put something in, a whiplash feeling. And I did those three seagulls so quickly that the, the centre one is all, it's very difficult to believe that it's actually a bird, but it's flying. They're definitely flying. And I thought, shall I go back and do that again? And I thought, no, don't, don't <laughs> leave it. Which is a, a terrible temptation to do something with work. And it's not necessary. I left it. And then I, I thought the man, somehow he should be connected with him. And so I turned him around, lifted his head, and raised his arm. And uh, it was interesting because shortly after that, I went on a walk from Appledore in Kent down to Rye, Sussex. Lovely walk along the military canals, lined with trees, lovely day, walking along. And, and then all of a sudden I saw a swan down the water. And the swan turned his head around and had a look at me. and I said, Greeting swan! <laughs> <laughs> me, I was in my picture. <laughs> Next. And this one uh, came and went. When uh, Chris chose this one, I, I was a bit taken aback because I had plans to change it in some way. <laughs> but this is something I do remember doing at one particular point. This was with this, this was my wife uh, first was a piece of cake was actually lying on the ground flat and I thought I've got to bring this up and so I thought oh, if I put a shadow behind it that should work and I put the shadow in and stood up and I thought well that's lovely <laughs> I was quite taken by surprise Next. Oh, then this is one of drawings that I, made, I have made in the country when I came back from Nigeria I started rediscovering the Kent countryside a lot of it which I had never seen before and every night I would go out, whether it was snowing or raining or whatever, and I would travel 5, 10, 15, 20, one, one, one night, 30 miles in, in the evening. But um, then I took to going on the train, getting out at a station. I, don't, I would have a circular walk home. 
and I'd walk until some, suddenly the landscape would speak to me and I'd sit down and do a drawing. But it was very much this question of reconnecting really with, my, with my past. Next. This one as well. Kent is full of orchards and when I was going to the grammar school in Faversham, I would travel on the bus seven miles to, to Faversham. And in the spring, you'd go through the orchards and they'd be sort of up the hills and beside the road. And the blossom, it was just like being in Elysium. It wasn't like being in the real world. Although we were very much real young people, I was still a rather foolish schoolboy mucking about on the bus. And I saw much aware of that. The orchards are very important. Nick. And this one, there's a story behind this, which I could repeat with other drawings. It's a, it's a lovely calm place near Shillam, not far from where we live. And uh, the lake, and trees, I sat there drawing, and it was so peaceful. And all of a sudden, bang, 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 a great big tractor comes by up to the right, outside, <coughs> and the gates open. And in it comes with a great machine which, which starts banging out, clattering around backwards and forwards, clearing the undergrowth. And I just had to stay and get on with the drawing. Um, it's so nice for me to look at this and think, well, I stuck it out <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't give up. That's something that happened on, on numerous occasions. I, I asked somebody if I could draw in their garden and they said, yes, certainly. I got myself settled down. Then he started mowing the grass. He yeah. was coming right up to me. Great big mouth. <laughs> Can you imagine doing it in someone's mouth? Okay. That is one of the that was lovely. That, that remained peaceful. That reminds me of one of my, my great gods, really, on Antoine Bateau, or whatever they call him in England. I don't know why. It's something to do with the shape of the trees, I think. A lovely afternoon there, John. And this one, this one I think of very much as characters, as people. The one on the right, very masculine, and the one in the centre, much more, much more delicate and feminine. And then on the left-hand side, there are two em it's an embraced couple over there, an affectionate couple. I've done a lot of drawing of landscapes in, in France. In France. And this one, I had a very strange feeling when I, we were in this garden in Bourges. In a way, there wasn't very much there, just the arches. But uh, I felt it was very necessary to draw it. And I sat down, with still with a strange feeling of certain mystery about it. And uh, eventually, when I got home and looked through drawings, I was, I was pleased with this one. And then I realized, all of a sudden, what this was, this feeling I had. And it's this. It's, again, a memory from Alice, with those two arches in the background. It was burnt into my remembrance. And that's it. And that one. I was painting flowers at this time, not not looking at I was looking at flowers and um, my wife would bring flowers home from the supermarket and we had them in the window and they were very enjoyable to look at of course. And I just wanted to paint flowers, I wanted the country and I wanted the conservatory and, and I thought I'd like to put somebody there. It's not me, I don't paint like that. But um, it was just a or just a situation that I enjoyed creating. I think in a way I did enjoy that. I, somebody says, you must love painting. I said, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is painful sometimes. Not always, but most of the time it's, go, goes, it's going wrong. Next time. Oh, that was wonderful. Condé, Condé on Brie. Yeah. I sat in the river bed and drew this, and uh, I left things out in the end because it's very much redrawn. It's very much an enlarged drawing which I've gone over with oil pastel. But close by there was there's a chateau, Chateau of Condé, and there I was told with a charming young woman who spoke lovely English and took us round, and uh, she said that Antoine Bateau had been there. I thought, oh no, what's over oh. here? <laughs> and there was a, there was a drawing of a lovely. A graceful couple dancing <coughs> on the wall, and a sort of minuet from lovely clothes and stuff. And they'd found two paintings of Watto's behind a mirror in one of the rooms. Wow. Incredible! And then they had paintings there. Oh, I just saw, I was just wandering around in a dream. <laughs> Next. Ah, yes. Now, it's, Robert has had the unfortunate experience of people going to the gallery and seeing my exhibition and saying, 
this is very nice, but why are you showing two artists? It's <laughs> <laughs> kept happening, apparently. Everything's quite fed up with it. Isn't it? No, I'm not two artists. My sculpture hasn't just sort of bounced out, or I thought, what? Oh, I'll make some sculpture. It evolved very slowly from two pieces of cardboard that I had a, a strange sense of needing in a painting in Nigeria. And that eventually led to this sort of thing. The collage is that kind of thing, and then various collages. All my collages are very personal. They're all, all to do with things to do with me, or in this case, my father. There are bits and pieces there connected with our camping in Nigeria and, and France and so on. If I, I hope I've got time. I hope I've got time just to say that this is quite an interesting story to do with this one. Because I was making it in one room, and those things were all in a great mass of paint, sloppy mass. And I got this onto the board, this stuff, um, and it was a complete experiment. I'd never done anything like this before, and I suddenly thought. Oh, I can't keep it. He's got to go into the studio. And I, I had to get this through the door of the, the, like the store where I was. And in order, he wouldn't go through. So I stepped back and tilted it. And this, all this, this mass of stuff began to slide over to it. Then I rushed towards the and turned it this way. And, all <laughs> and then I turned it back. Going, and I was going along the corridor, along a very nice carpet. So I was doing this, and then eventually I got into the studio. All this stuff doing this. Oh dear, yes, that, that was a really uh, sweaty moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one, this is a hammer that I brought back over to Sahara, actually. Another story I, I could tell you about that. I I I know it You've got time. Um, and this was again, this is cloth soaked in paint and then made into this. They always, this always reminds me of the Maynards, the dancing Maynard, Maynard figures in, in the British Museum. This one, those were, these are finials which I picked up in, in France for rubbish heap. And it arose from hearing somebody say, What does a broken heart look like? And I thought, Well, that's really interesting. So I had a piece of marble and I carved a broken heart and then I put the sentinels in. One of the sentinels is, is, is so effective, he's so sort of um, worn down by this tragedy of the broken heart that he's collapsed with his uh, rifle still in his hand. And below him there are these little, these little Ghanaian figures. Brass, they're brass weights for uh, weighing gold. And the three here, they're, they're actually, that man's got his hands tied behind his back. They look rather distressed. And I thought they were rather suitable for this, this, this monument, this shrine, this broken heart. Yeah. And this one, this is a very high relief, actually, very high relief. And so what's happening is that my sculpture is slowly developing towards the three dimensional. Yeah. And this one it is completely three-dimensional, but still in the sense of wall piece. And it's very, it's very well shown there against the wall. And this one, a collection of these were letters which were in a, a room I was teaching in, a room I was terribly fond of, and it was going to be destroyed. I had a, a lovely view through the window with an old apple tree there. It was just so full of character, and beyond it, the big tower of Canterbury Cathedral. Wonderful view. Uh, the place was destroyed, the apple tree was torn up, oh. and you know what happened. And these were going to be thrown out, so I decided to use them. That's actually a, it's just behind here a ceramic figure with a ceramic head. And they, they don't make sense, those, those letters, just piled up one on the other. <coughs> and I think there may well be, you, you might say, oh, Westminster Cathedral. Well, I could be, yes. Maybe. Next. My, the three dimensional, now we know it's three dimensional sculpture, and it's all figurative. I don't quite know what the reason is, but I do find that when I'm making a figure like this, when I'm making a form like this, for instance, and, and bending the clay and moulding it, that there's something very physical. You know, I could, I could actually be holding my own arm. So there's that feeling of a contact with something living that, that has the place a a part in the, the, in the process, and also something a bit, you might, well, the crew would say so, but cubist, if you might, abstractly. Next. And that one again, I had a, a girl, a girl actually, uh, posing for this, and then when she'd gone, she was an African girl, um, 
when Richie had gone, I changed the hair, the, the shape of the hair wasn't strong enough, and uh, so I made, made it much more cubic. Next. This, is a, this is a maquette for a large sculpture for a garden for the blind. My wife and I saw a garden for the blind in Bath, a lovely little garden, and I said, oh, I must put a sculpture there. And I wanted a sculpture for blind people to touch. I just imagined a young child climbing up the steps and, and, and feeling the bird, you know. Um, and in fact, the, the large piece was actually made. Robert has uh, shown it in London. And, uh, but unfortunately, it, it never took off. It would have been vandalised. I realised that after I'd made it, and I, I didn't push the project at all in the end. Um, but it was interesting because a friend had a blind woman friend and she said that they'd been to an exhibition and they were told, given a lecture about why you mustn't touch the sculpture. And I could have died. I thought, oh, God, <laughs> she, you can't do that. Get around here. So she came round, and it was a wonderful experience. I'd take things to her and say, now, now hold this. What do you think this is? You know, I remember one particular one. She said, well, I can't really make this out. It's an abstracted horse. Very, very simple sort of horse like this. Quite small. And, and the rider was just a vertical like that. Uh, and I said, well, it's actually a horse for the rider. Oh, oh, yes, and I see. And, oh, a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm really sorry that that project never came to conclusion. Next. And this one, I had a girl posing for that. She used to come fairly regularly for life drawings. And she did the sitting pose rather like this. And I suddenly said, oh, Mary Jane, I've got to make a sculpture of this. So I started the sculpture, and then she went. I didn't need her there. And I finished it off, and I put the child in, and uh, she came back for another drawing. I said, oh, look, I've finished the sculpture, have a look at it. And so she came into the other one, and, had it, and, she, and she looked at the back, and she said, oh, she said, that's just my back. And it's, it's, that was a very nice compliment, because the back is not nicely smooth. It's, it's quite angular. Um, you, know, you see, have a look at it, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Nick. This one, I'm finishing off now, and uh, showing you abstracts. I call this spatial poem. I think it's a general statement. I could say that no matter what artist I come, up, come upon, I may acknowledge their brilliance, but if there's not something poetic there, they will never really get to me in the way that Watto or Claude Lorraine or Chagall, for instance, who's a great uh, god of mine, would. Uh, somebody was asking me about, did I like David Hockney last night? And I, I said, yes, he's, he's, he's brilliant, and wonderful theatre designs and landscapes and so on. But it never really gets to me because there's nothing poetic about David. It's, it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> Next. And this, I, uh, she always very bright in print. You can see from the painting on the wall here. It's, uh, that, that's very strong. And this is an example of a period when I was painting abstract pictures and then figures, as it were, said we're coming in. And the reason for that, next, oh, I'll show you, I'll get, I'll get to another one, I'll, I'll talk a bit more. Next. Uh, yes, I, I actually remember the sequence here. I put the, it was all a, a bit soft. I liked it, but it didn't quite work. And I put the yellow square in first. Then I put the black lines in up top left, and the last thing was the arrow. I also, before, before that, I put these in as well, cut little bits, shapes out of picture. Uh, a piece of paper and push the, the colour through. Next. Oh, this one. This, how I got into the mode, I don't know, but this was a girl drawing in a garden. She was drawing a piece of sculpture, which was over here. Like, it was very much like a Sura. And I thought, well, this is rather good. I, you know, I, I should have said to myself, OK, you think that's good? It's lousy. It's always a perfect sign that something is going wrong. If I look at a painting, I think, oh, that's rather good. <laughs> no, I've had it. <laughs> but I did. I thought, oh, look at this. You know, it's really it's just what I like about Sura. I think I've got something here. And uh, I was in a sort of dream world, uh, but not the right kind of dream world. And then I, I, I suddenly realised what nonsense I was painting and uh, began knocking it around, pushing things around. Something which Chagall had really taught me, that to disrupt normal perspective is to allow you to enter into a world of imagination. And she was there drawing, and there's another woman over there under the tree. 
She's now, my wife described it, sitting in the other person's lap, and so on. And eventually, after a long struggle, I, I think I got it to work. But it was only through violently disrupting the first painting. Yeah. Okay. This one was an abstract sort of landscape. It was coming, I wasn't quite sure what I was getting. Uh, it seemed to be, I seemed to be putting down the right thing somehow. And then I wanted this, this same yellow square element, which I've used before, and I put that in. And suddenly something began to, what does it do? It reverberates. There's a sort of shimmer that happens, and you think, this is right. And I then put the cross in. We've been to Naples for two weeks, and I knew I've got to be careful because if I started putting crosses in, I was going to get literal. I was going to start doing Naples churches, which I didn't want. So I put these little forks in to make sure it wasn't the top of a church. And then I put some. I tried another one over there, the yellow one. And then all of a sudden, the yellow one looked like a, an airplane, and it wasn't too literal. So I said, "Okay, that's fine." And then I saw the yellow as a, an airport shopping bag. And uh, I thought, yeah, we're leaving Naples. Here we run the plane. <laughs> and so I put the handle in. I wasn't going to put it right in the centre. That would be dark. That would be so mundane. So I put it over on the left. And the bottle is a bottle of limoncello, which we hunted around to buy in Naples. <laughs> and uh, uh, Rob was asking for, for some comments on the pictures. And I, the comment I made about that was, that's a comment about... I'm in charge. I draw bottles like I want to. <laughs> so it's leaving Naples. Okay, next. And this last picture, uh, I came across a lovely reproduction of a bonbon. There was Mart at the table and Pierre in the background reflected in the mirror. And I thought, oh, I'd just like to blow it up and make a copy of that and have it on my wall. And I did actually blow it up. I very carefully drew it, squared it up, and so on. Got it up. There was Mart, there was Pierre, and so on in the mirror. And then it's like the sur the Sura painting, the silly Sura painting. I thought, oh, what are, you, what are you doing? This is not you at all. So then I got I got irritated. But that's a very good sign usually that I get so frustrated with a picture that I want to start knocking it about. And uh, that's what I did there. And in the end, uh, looking at it after that process and not not really being as brutal as I perhaps intended or thought I was being. For me, that's uh, that's celebration of uh, light and south of France and, and so on. I hope I haven't spoken too long. No, no, no. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's it. <laughs>